Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Expect Asians podcast. I'm here with uh, my good friend, uh, Tujer Song. Uh, I guess we've just really gotten to know each other maybe like a year, year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. But I've been a big fan of his. Uh, if you don't know him, um, he's a comedian, motivational speaker. Um, I think one of the first people, Hmong guys to really grow their own brand before anybody was able to really do that in our culture. So I... Someone I looked up to, uh, oh, I someone that, that I, uh, I, um, you know, I think is a real cool guy. He's doing a lot of great work for the community in general. So appreciate you being on, man. Yeah, well, I'm very honored. Thank yeah. you. It's episode five. Uh, kind of give people. Um, I always like to start with this, which is kind of give people like your chapter one in your book, like mm-hmm. when kind of like you were born, like where, where right. were you, like right. kind of give us that background, your childhood. Yeah. How was that? Yeah, so I'm considered um, first generation, right? Because mm-hmm. I was born in Laos. Yep. We left the country when I was two years old mm-hmm. and then stayed in a refugee camp for four years. So my first recollection of like life and, you know, just I have recollections of me running around barefoot, yep. like, you know, without clothes, you know, like mm-hmm. butt naked, you know, um, in the refugee camps, right? Playing in the dirt. Um, and I remember like, you know, where we got our food that we had to hike quite a ways to even fill up our buckets of water. And so these are kind of my childhood memories in the refugee camps. Mm. And then and when I was six, we came to America. Of okay. course, came to Minnesota. Um, you know, in, in my show, my life story comes out through my performances and my comedic performances. Because I'm talking about first time I saw white people, right? Yeah. And the blonde hair and the long nose, how scary <laughs> that was. Yep. You know, talk about like the first encounter with the toilet and peeing outside and mm. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and for me now, I'm able to kind of reflect um, about my childhood. Um, so when we came here, we, we, uh, we grew up in St. Paul. We were that first wave that dealt with all the, the racial slurs and the racial epithets. Yeah. And like, you know, imagine. Chinese, yeah. Japanese, go back to your country, mm-hmm. you know, getting bullied, down, get, uh, getting bullied, getting picked on. And then having to go through this transition of finding our identity and um, standing up for us, finding the courage mm-hmm. to stand up for ourselves, yeah. right? Because back then it was like... Oh, you We always kind of saw ourselves as, oh, just be mm. grateful that you're here. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, my generation, we got this a lot. You, if you go to school, you get picked on, you come home, you tell your parents, they're going to beat you up too, right? They're like, it's your fault you got to <laughs> yeah. fight, right? Yeah. And so they're like, the corner, all right? Mm-hmm. Because this idea that you don't really, be, even our, it was internalized oppression. Mm. And so we went through that phase. Um, of course, when we came here, a lot of Hmong, all the Hmong families lived in the projects. I was just joking with a buddy today. Back in the day, we didn't say, hey, where do you live? Yeah. We said, which housing project <laughs> do you live in, right? Because it, it was either in St. Paul, it was Mount Airy, mm-hmm. McDonough, yeah. Liberty Plaza, Roseville Home, mm-hmm. or Congress, right? Mm-hmm. There were like five, it, it was like our, our village identity gotcha. was like our project, yeah. housing project's yeah. identity. And then... Um, having to grow up in, 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 you know, those are my teenage years and high school years. Mm-hmm. And then I was fortunate. Um, I got a pretty good scholarship to go to Carleton College, mm-hmm. which which was the first time I actually stepped out of my community. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it wasn't far away, but it wasn't, I didn't get the distraction of, you know, the weekend hoopley one thing, you know, keep day ceremonies. Yeah. Um, I really had a chance to live among and, and eat among and study among other people, like, um, because it's the uh, it's a Carlton's a pretty liberal arts school. Yep. And so they I would say about ninety percent of our students were from outside of Minnesota. Gotcha. So my first roommate was some son of some vice president, executive, yeah. attorney, high power attorney from um, South America. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm sitting next to like children of CEOs <laughs> yeah. and you know president of colleges, and I'm thinking, Sheesh. whoa, this is how rich people act and yeah. think, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it it's was crazy. just a, a, a yeah. such an eye opener yeah. to kind of see myself from that privilege, mm-hmm. um, that that privilege perspective, um, or my community in the sense. And then mm-hmm. people say you don't know how poor you are because in the refugee camps we were, we were it. We're like man, life is happy, right? Yeah, we didn't have yeah. shoes, but yeah. so what, right? Yeah, that's we what were hungry, was. but we weren't dying of starvation, and it didn't realize how. Um, Unfortunate, our circumstances were mm-hmm. until I started to see America through a different lens, mm-hmm. right? So Ooh. that's sort of my... you growing up pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah. that's like my upbringing. Childhood. Childhood. Yeah. yeah, and the motivation to everything that I base my life work on now. Yeah, you know? I love that. 
Talk a little bit about, so let's backtrack a little bit here. I mean, that was a lot, and yeah. I want to kind of dig into a lot, a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so you come here, um, you're six years old, mm -hmm. and you're going through, like, a lot of, you know, pretty much a lot of new things, meeting a lot of new people, do, doing things that you haven't done before. Talk a little bit about, like, those experiences, and, like, when you first came here, like, you, you, you have a, a bit, I guess, on, like, you yeah. see, seeing... You got people for the first time. Right. What was that like for yeah. you and your family? So when I started out, I have this whole half an hour comedy piece about just the first day in America, yeah. right? And the all the visuals, like the the traffic lights, the buildings, the cars, yeah. the noise. I mean, as a kid from the refugee camp, things were very basic. Mm -hmm. You hungry? You eat? Yep. Sleep? Um, you know, you chew marbles. You um, you you kind of run around and then you, you help out with your chores where you can. Mm -hmm. It was just day-to-day -day survival. Here, there's all of this technology distraction. So, mm -hmm. um, what, year, what year was this? Kind of, this was the, 1979. The 1979. Yeah, 1979. Okay, yeah. So, how many? How many of you guys were there? Like, so siblings? they were. They we came yes. here. There were ten of us that came. Okay. Yeah. So I have six brothers, four sisters. Gotcha. Now my oldest sister, she had already lived here. Mm. So she uh, came here with my brother-in-law. So they sponsored us, like gotcha. a lot of Hmong families okay. there. Yep. And when we first came here, again, we kind of had her as sort of the cultural expert to say, oh, you can do this, you can't do that, you know, mm -hmm. showing us this is how you open a refrigerator, mm -hmm. you know, this is where you plug in the outlet, but don't stick your finger in there, yeah. right, you know, yeah. uh, um, this is the, 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 the how a sink works, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. How old was she? Because you were six. How old yeah, was I was six. She was already um, in her 20s. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, she came over because she was married. Already. Yeah. So she came with my brother-in-law. Gotcha. So, um, and then you know, just like this is how you navigate the public transportation mm -hmm. system because we couldn't drive, right? Yeah. Uh, we had to take. We had to go and get our immunization shots mm -hmm. so we can go to school, right? Yeah. This is where you get the to get on the bus. I mean, <clears throat> so a lot of these things were just basically teaching a baby how mm -hmm. to crawl again, yeah. right? Yeah. Baby steps. And I remember my first day of school, I got on the bus, went to school. Um, and, you know, basically my mom's like, you do what they do. So I'm thinking, man, how do you survive this, right? <laughs> and here you, I'm sitting among a sea of white people, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, this is weird. I know it's supposed to be a good thing. We don't have to be worrying about war or hunger. But how, like, how do I find myself? Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember on the way home, I got on the bus. And it was about learning, my, learning to find my voice, too, because the bus driver took us to school. And then they helped me get on the bus on the way home. Bus driver stopped and no one. This we 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 came here in the middle of the school year, yeah. so I just sat there and no. One, I was waiting for people to tell me what to do. Yeah. And the bus driver waited for a bit, waited for a bit, and then just took <laughs> off. Yeah. So I'm like, wait a minute. And by then, I'm like, wait, wait. In my head, I'm thinking, that's my house. Yeah. That's where I live. Yep. But no, but since no one told me to get off the bus, mm -hmm. I, I I was waiting for instructions. Yeah. And so I end up dropping everybody off, mm -hmm. right? And the bus driver's like. Why are you still on here? And I remember just using like you know hand signals and because no and, English yet, right? right. And then I remember English they said, yeah. "Okay, now we know you're that kid that didn't get off the bus." Mm. And they had to backtrack and send me back. And gotcha. I, I remember I didn't get home to like like much later. <laughs> but it's those little things <laughs> yeah. that make you appreciate our journey, yeah. right? As young yeah. refugees. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, man. That's so crazy. Yeah, a lot of that stuff like our generation we don't even think about. You know? Right. Because. We don't. We couldn't even like fathom or imagine right. stuff like that. You guys have to go through. So yeah. that's great to. And even even coming on the on the plane, I remember um, the lady. I remember we were just kind of you know like in this little section together, and and the lady on the plane, the uh, the flight attendant came and gave us like Pepsi, right? I was like, oh man, Pepsi, right? Mm -hmm. I love Pepsi, right? Because mm -hmm. it's sugar, and they also gave us bread. I dip my bread in my Pepsi, right? Because we like yeah. bread is a plain, yeah. doesn't have any flavor, so I dipped into the Pepsi to uh -huh. get the sugar. And I love that in the yeah. refugee camp. We try to be creative with whatever mm -hmm. food we get, oh, yeah. right? Yep. That's how we and I remember the way I remember this, this lady come by and said, No, you're not supposed to do that. And she took my bread away and she really? took my Pepsi away. She gave me a new cup, like a, a, a new glass. And a new bread. And I said, lady, you don't know how to eat this like I do. I still put it right back in. I'm like, you're like, don't teach me yeah. how to eat this. Yeah. I'm a refugee kid. Yeah. Like, I know how to eat this. Yeah. So it's those little things that make, I think back, I kind of mm -hmm. laugh at it. Mm -hmm. But it makes me humble to say, wow, you know, like, we, we've come a long way. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, so <clears throat> talk a little bit about, I guess, you in high school. Um, yeah. Before you got to Carlton. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, like. 
I know you're a valley Victorian of, of your class, yeah, right? Yeah. But were you, I guess, even unless you as a kid, were you always like just yourself all the time? Like, I mean, I know you pretty well, but not many other people might yeah. not. You were just kind of like a loud, right. kind of out there guy, just always yeah. up front. Um, yeah. Kind of life the party pretty much, I yeah. guess is the right term. Um, were you always like that? No, around? no. When we first came here, I couldn't. I I fit that mode of like your typical shy Asian yep. kid, right? Yep. Like, don't rock the boat. Be quiet. Yep. Pay attention. Um, you know, shut up. Don't say nothing unless you're called on, yep. right? Um, so we and, and a lot of us were brought um, brought to because that was the these were sort of the um, examples of a good monk kid, right? Yep. A good monk son. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until like I think. I started when I was in uh, middle school, I experimented with like theater. Mm. And I remember going to see this play when I was in elementary school at the state capitol. And these little white kids got up, they were at my age, but they got up in front. And they were like articulate, they were acting out these scenes this about the founding school. fathers. Yeah, they yeah. were in grade school. Yeah. So oh, I saw okay. other white kids in grade school mm -hmm. acting stuff out. And it wasn't that they're on TV, they were about 10 feet away from me. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, Wow, that kid's not shy at all, right? Yeah, like, yeah. how did he go? How do I get to to that level? You're good. good. I'm just You're good. Toss this over here. So I go, how do I get to that level where I'm not shy? Yep. And I was like, oh, I need to join theater, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I've always wanted, um, was curious about entertainment mm -hmm. and and performing. So I started performing, and I got involved in theater in middle school, and I got to play um, the. The, the director saw that I had this gift of like, hey, this is unlike a lot of Asian kids. This kid's, he could, you know, he can hit the, he do the lines yeah. and he can have some personality. Mm -hmm. So she assigned me to some roles. I was like the big bad wolf. Yeah. You know, because wow, yeah, she, she was like, role. can you do a howl that goes, howl, <laughs> right? And there you go. I was like this little monk kid, right? Yeah. Um, okay. And like with the right guidance and mentorship, mm -hmm. she was like, no, no, take a deep breath. You got to breathe from the belly, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, at first, you imagine, you're like, I'm like, oh, she's like, no, 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 you got to give it to me 10 times bigger, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, and she was like, yeah. So I realized, man, I could do this, man, yeah. right? Yeah. And I guess you, you, um, you've you heard the term stage fright. I kind of got my first dose, dosage of stage like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I did this play um, um, in, in uh, middle school, and, you know, I saw, like, I saw how the crowd reacted to my mm -hmm. to my performance, and I'm yeah. like, man, I kind of got this high off of it. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I gotta I gotta do more stuff on stage. Mm -hmm. I gotta write more stuff. Yeah. So I did uh, like one act plays. I was like the Scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz, and I got a lot of other monk kids to join theater too. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first monk to join theater. Yeah. And so it kind of became this movement. Like, no, we do not have to be just these quiet walk along the side of the lockers and then, you know yeah. get picked on. We can be the star students, mm -hmm. the star athletes, mm -hmm. the president of the student council, right? Gotcha. We can be the president of your senior class mm -hmm. and um, host dances and not mm -hmm. host the Asian culture show. So yeah. I started this Asian culture club in my high school, too. Okay. Because I was like, wait a minute, man, we got a lot of talent, right? Yeah. Like at 2 o'clock when the bell rang, end of the day, all the monk kids, you can see all the Asian kids just start walking home to the projects. Mm -hmm. And all the white kids are like going to basketball, all that going to student activities. count, setting up for dances, yep. right? Um, you know, going to like theater and debate. I'm like, man, their their fun day just started and our day just ended. Yeah. Where, where do we go home? So what the idea? <laughs> do the dishes, you yeah. know, go help clean the house, yeah. wash the toilet. Yeah. You know, I'm like, no. So that's where the real, I think, mm. character exploration um, and inflection of like who we are, our, our finding our voice and our narrative began. Gotcha. And so I'm like, no, I don't want to go home. Yeah. You know, I want to stay at school. I'm gonna find something to do. Yeah. So I started this some after school um, groups, and um, for me it was empowering because mm. when we started the Asian club, we hosted our dance, we hosted like fundraisers and picnics and like assemblies, and um, we became one of the most active organizations because mm -hmm. now these monk kids had something to do and something to live yeah. for outside of the classroom. Gotcha. So yeah, so that's why I also started building like leadership skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, and that I still use to this day. Like, that makes you know, sense. I mean, that total, make, that makes total sense. Yeah. Um, to line up to like, kind of like type, type person you are now and where you are now. Um, talk <clears> a little bit about um, you being valedictorian and how 
I guess, was that more of like motivation from yourself? Like, yeah. I want to be the best in class, or is it more like I can make my parents proud? Or maybe a little bit of a mix of both. It's a little bit of both. Yeah. Because, <clears throat> now keep in mind, I came here, and I, I think back, Christian, I'm so blessed that I think for me it was divine timing, right? Because I, I, um, I came here at the, I think the perfect age where I remember not having shoes. I remember being hungry. Yeah. I remember pictures that there's still pictures of me where I don't even have pants on, right? Mm. And I'm running around like butt naked in the refugee camp as a happy little refugee kid. So because these these memories are still very much a part of my my existence. Now when I do have a pair of shoes, mm -hmm. I do have a book bag, my own locker, right? Then I'm like, oh man, I'm blessed. Grateful. I'm Great. grateful. Yep. And I'm humble to be in this position where mm -hmm. so many are still in the refugee camp. Yep. Some died in the war. There are people who are risking their lives to have what I have. Mm -hmm. So when I have that that you know with that meal and my dad's like, you got to share this with three brothers. I'm like, that's fine. Yep. I'm just glad to have that. Yep. Right. When I have my room, I shared a room with. We all lived in the housing projects. I shared a room with three brothers. Yep. And I didn't think never for once. I growing up, I didn't think. Darn it! Why can't I have my own room? Mm, yeah. Because it was always I never really thought I. I've always thought we. Mm -hmm. And so along with the mentality, also came the the sort of um, the mentality that you know what, and you know our parents always ingrained this. Be thankful you have a second chance living your life in a country where there's no war. Yeah. Be thankful you have a roof over your head, right? Mm -hmm. Don't you know what we sacrificed? The people who died along the Mekong River. They would say, because you fall with you, they say, 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 so appreciate it, because mom and dad never saw the inside of a classroom. Yep. So it was that fundamental mentality that kind of like set the stage for academics. Like, for example, it was like, there wasn't like, oh, like when we were growing up, it wasn't like, do I want to go to school today? I'm kind of not feeling well. It wasn't like, mom, can I stay? It was like, if I'm sick, I still got to go, yep. get my assignments so they don't mark me absent, mm -hmm. and then I'll come home. Mm -hmm. There wasn't even a question about it. Gotcha. It wasn't, like parents, these yeah. days parents are like, how do you feel, honey? Do you want to go to school? <laughs> our parents didn't ask that. Yeah, no. Get your butt up. It is time, right? Yeah. You got extra homework you to breathe do. You breathe in, you go, yeah. you go to school, pretty much. So yeah. um, even we're like, mom, dad, I got a headache, you know? Mm -hmm. yep. I, mean, <laughs> I think back, I'm like, dad, I broke my leg. We're like, oh, carry your leg, hop on one <laughs> leg to get to school, yep. and then we'll take you to the doctor later. Yeah. So it was that mentality, mm. um, and and because of that, our parents were um, they were always kind of even though they didn't know like what we were studying biology, yeah. they didn't know the difference between trigonometry, geometry, yeah. right? Yeah, they just knew that if you're in school, you're learning. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, my dad, you know, mom, even though as as they didn't have any formal education, but they knew the commitment to excellence was going to be. They knew education. how important it was. Right. They knew so, it was set you up. And we went, they knew the difference between an A and a D, yeah. right? Yeah. So they knew that. So yep. they learned broken English. Yep. So like a D is bad, an A is good. Yep. A plus is really good. Yep. They're like, well, you better get an A plus. That's it. That's, that's, that's not, yep. Okay. Cool. I got to tell you like about this valedictorian thing, right? Because my yeah. dad, because my sister a year older than me, she was also the valedictorian. Mm. And so here's my dad at graduation because <laughs> she was giving the speech, right? Yep. And, uh, and uh, you know, my dad goes, Duna, go I'm like, Dad, she's a valedictorian. You know what that means? You can't do better than that. You know, that's A++. But my dad's mentality was, he was saying that to inspire me, right? Yeah. To say, hey, man, you could do it too. Mm -hmm. You know, now I can also understand how some kids might misperceive that to say, man, the, the expectation is too high. Like, yeah. There's too much pressure, right? Yeah. So it's how you perceive mm -hmm. the information. And if my dad was so harsh on me, I would have taken it differently. But because he had so much love for me, and I saw how he sacrificed for That's me. That's a good intent. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I knew it came from a place of love. Yeah, I can also understand, though, these days where a lot of young people may may perceive that as coming from a place of pressure yep. and expectation, and they resent that and push mm -hmm. back. Yeah. So, um yeah, that's something that I think to to be yeah. to be mindful of. But I think it's good that your dad set that up for you because I think, like you said, it comes from a place of love. It's, I think it's good intent, but mm -hmm. also it's like you should try try to get be the best. Right. You know, right. if you're not, then right, it's cool. At least you're closer than you know, not closer than pretty much failing. So I mean, you right. try your best because your dad expects you to do that. Right. Which I, my parents expect the same from me. I'm not a good student at all, but I mean. 
um, it just comes from a good place. They just want you to do well. That's right, that's, right. that's the end goal. But yeah, right. um, so you're Valley Victorian, you graduate, go to Carleton College. Mm-hmm. What did you What did you graduate with there? So when I went to school, they're like, what do you want to major in, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know, right? Yeah. I just know I want to go to liberal arts school where I can study like a variety of classes. Yeah. I knew I didn't want to be a doctor. Mm-hmm. I didn't like sick, you know, like if I go to hospitals, I don't like the smell of hospitals, mm-hmm. right? I yeah. could see myself um, hanging around sick people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I knew I probably didn't want to be a lawyer because, you know, but I... I I grew up, um, I did, watched... Did your parents want you to be one of those things? Oh, my parents, my dad, my mom, dad, like that. They were like, you know? You know, you know, because he wanted, like, a doctor, a lawyer. He wanted to diversify all, all his kids to all these professions of yeah. res- reputable, you know, like, um, respectful, yeah. you know, and noble... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Titles. Uh, yeah. yeah, occupation. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so how do I get, a, how do I get about, get around this, right? Yeah. But I went to, um, so I always loved politics, and uh, you know, because I was involved with student government. Sure. And even in high school, I was, um, I I think I would say I was probably more woke and more mature than other students, because I was already thinking about the bigger picture of our journey coming here, mm-hmm. like as refugees, the narrative that hasn't been told. Because we go to school, we're not American enough. We come home, we're not Hmong enough. We're caught in two worlds. Yep. Are we refugees? Are we immigrants? Are we aliens? Like, these were terms that didn't resonate well yep. to me, right? Because refugees, you see people um, running from war. Immigrants, you see them packed like sardines coming through Ellis yep. Island. And then the word alien, you see, I think about this big-headed green guy with the two big <laughs> yeah. eyes, you know, like, like from the alien movie, yeah. sci-fi movie. Yeah. I'm like, that's not us. Yeah. And then I... You know, the woke part came in when my dad, I started reading more about my identity and my journey as a Hmong refugee. We are warriors. My dad went to war at the age of 15, mm. you know? They didn't ask, when they asked my dad to fight, they didn't say, can you take a, a, uh, a test to see how much you could, how, how well you understand English? Mm. They're like, can you fire this gun without falling down? Then go fight for freedom, for democracy with Americans. Mm. And can you imagine, like, oh, at 15, you're like, all right, let's do it. Yep. And you and a bunch of teenage friends, most of these days, some 25-year-olds don't even have that kind of maturity, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so my dad had to grow up really fast. So I think about, we were soldiers, right, as Hmong people. We were warriors and hunters and mm-hmm. farmers at the highest elevation where other groups couldn't even survive at that level because they didn't practice the kind of farming and lifestyle that we mm-hmm. did. So these labels were empowering versus the labels of refugee immigrants mm-hmm. living on welfare, coming here to take away, steal America's tax dollars. Mm-hmm. So even in high school, I was having these conversations. So I knew that I wanted my college wow. experience yeah. to be able to help me think deeper and to another level of consciousness, mm-hmm. right? And then I, wa- I knew that I wanted to be, like when I saw um, video clips of Dr. King mm-hmm. marching, right? Giving a speech like, oh, I have a dream that one day. And you know, um, I don't know if you've seen these videos of black and white, but you can hear yeah. the echo yeah. of these. He's like, they're my four children who live in a nation where they not, will not be judged by the color of the skin, mm-hmm. but by the content of their character. Mm-hmm. And he had this speech. And for me, I grew up listening to stories, so I try to like appreciate the, the passion, right? Mm-hmm. And I got the chills, I'm like, dang, <laughs> who's that black dude, right? I'm talking like, is he a king, is he a reverend, is he a doctor, right? Yeah. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah. had this long name. Yeah. And then later on learned the, 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 his life work. Of that and you learn about the ugliness of America, mm-hmm. that the American dream was, you know, can can be an American nightmare for some people. Mm-hmm. And you learn, wait a minute, they call him all these horrible names and try to bomb his house and kill kill him, and eventually he died for a cause greater than himself. Mm-hmm. And then I think back, wait, they called us chinks and goose. And when we were living the projects, our windows were broken by mm-hmm. the kids in the neighborhood because they feared us for no reason at all. Yeah. Um, they try to burn our house. Mm-hmm. So I start to relate to this, what I call the backstory, the multicultural America. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so in college, I knew that I wanted my experience there to be able to, um, to be like, we don't have a Hmong Dr. King, right? Yep. To be able to educate and elevate our community to, to mm-hmm. um, you know, into society, to, for equality and human rights. So yeah, so in college, I, I studied political science. Yep. Um, I knew I wanted to do something in government, um, but then the other flip side is that I was I was kind of like a, almost like, like uh, 
two personalities because I watched Eddie Murphy, right? <laughs> Chris Rock. Yeah. And I was like, man, these guys are funny as I do. Yeah. Like, how do you get up on stage, talk to a bunch of white people for an hour and a half, and charge millions of dollars, mm -hmm. right? Um, and talk about your life being poor. Like, there's this bit Eddie Murphy does, this comedy bit about growing up in the projects mm -hmm. and when ice cream man come around. And he does this, I got ice cream, you don't got ice cream. And I'm like, dude, that's our stories in the projects, right? Yeah, yeah. And so there's, you, when I learned about like black America and multicultural America, mm -hmm. I saw myself in that picture. Mm -hmm. And that was empowering for me as a mm -hmm. young Hmong refugee trying to find herself, right? Because gotcha. we were labeled gangs. Because mm -hmm. we look alike, we walk alike, and we talk alike. Mm -hmm. So for those who didn't understand this, oh, that's an Asian gang, yeah. right? In St. Paul, the the word gang, Asian gang, the Asian gang summit and the Asian gang strike force was formed because of these monk kids, a bunch of refugee nerdy kids who just trying to come together so they can protect themselves yeah. and form an identity. Mm -hmm. And so, and that evolved to become, you know, this attitude like, yo, forget the system because mm -hmm. the system doesn't think about us. Yeah. We don't look up for ourselves. So, yeah, so I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but no, dude, my... Fine. Even at college, I, my mind was like everywhere. Yeah. I wanted to do yeah. performance. I wanted to work in government. I want to um, volunteer. I want. I love hip hop. I like. I love to write. Yeah. Um, I saw the power of hip hop and, and rap and how that that's a great that's a, a effective way of of telling a story yeah. while entertaining them. So I started writing like rap songs in high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so. In college, that all just kind of came together. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy because, like, I feel like uh, a lot of kids in high school and even college, even myself growing up, didn't really know what they wanted to do. So I think right. you, knowing what you kind of, the, the kind of the direction that you were going mm -hmm. um, early on is just awesome. Yeah. You know? I think my problem was I wanted to do everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you graduate <clears throat> with your bachelor's. Yep. And your parents obviously want you to get your master's and PhD, right, right. which you didn't yeah, do, correct? I did it. What was your reaction to that? So, I was actually, originally the plan was to go to college, get my degree in political science, yep. go work for my senator and my congressman, mm -hmm. which I did. I interned for my um, congressman, Bruce Mento. Okay. I was actually spent three months in D.C. Mm. Um, as an intern for his office. And then, um, you know probably even like volunteer and work for like a community organization and eventually maybe run for office, mm -hmm. right? Be like, um, you know, like a local city council or state rep or something, yep. school board or something so I can um, affect policy on a different level. But do, by fate, man, I, I remember junior, junior year, senior year, I started, um, I, I started writing proposals for conferences. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, let, I wanna do a presentation among youth, the Hmong Youth Voice. Um, what it means to grow up as a Hmong refugee youth. And I would go to these these conferences and speak for free. Like, I'd have to pay my own way, you yeah. know, my own plane ticket. Mm -hmm. And I remember after some of these presentations, teachers would come up, people in the audience who were professionals, who would say, hey, do you have a card? Do you have an agent? Mm -hmm. Like, what's your rate? I'm like, no, I don't got none of that. I'm just a poor college student. Yeah. I had to pay for my own lunch beer, you know, yeah. and carpool to come to this conference. Mm -hmm. And they said, they had said, you know, Hey, you should, you should, um, they, they gave me the idea of branding. You should go and speak to schools. You should mm -hmm. get a card. What's your rate? Can you invoice this? I'm like, no, I don't, what's an invoice? Yeah. I don't know what an invoice yeah. is. So there's a term that say fake it till you make it, right? Mm -hmm. And supposedly, I was like, okay, apparently they like my message. I said, listen, I'll come do it for free. You know, I was that door to door comic, yeah. that motivational speaker, right? Like, yo, you just pay for gas money and yeah. um, give me a bag lunch and I'm good, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, so like when I was in college, I got invited to pres to do Hmong storytelling at the local library in this town where I went to college. And on Saturday morning, I get there, and there's five other storytellers from like African culture, like you know, um, you know, like Native American culture, white culture, whatever. So I was like the Hmong storyteller, mm -hmm. and everyone pulled up their books and they told their stories like a you know like a librarian yeah. telling a story. Hey, you know, in Make our culture, this. Yeah. <laughs> so I did a Hmong style because I knew. When I was growing up, I listened to my dad. My dad went, he went into the zone. He was like, And he got into this rhythm, this flow. And as a kid, I was just glued to his eyes and his, his, the fluctuation of his voice. Yeah. And I'm thinking, man, for me at that time, I, 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 
I equate that to the equivalent of today's age of watching like a um, Lord of the Rings in, mm. in, in high definition, yeah. right? It was surround sound because that's what his, my dad's voice was. I'm like, what? Yeah. So, so he was so animated. And so when I got up on stage to tell this uh, to a bunch of uh, uh, little kids, elementary kids at this mm -hmm. library, I jumped up on the table barefoot. I had my monk clothes on. I started telling stories of dragons. I didn't even have any prompts of like to do the dragon's mouth. I, you know, go like this with my hands are, all right. <laughs> and these little kids like, oh man, that guy's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I did pretty good because afterwards they're like, man, you you were really how, good. How old are you at this time? I was probably like 20, 21. Wow, yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, I was probably like just uh, so sophomore junior year. Mm -hmm. And the librarian's like, that was really good. Here's a bag lunch, you know. Here's a here's a t-shirt. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, man, I got a free free lunch. Yeah. Um, and then after that, it kind of snowballed from there. Like mm -hmm. she told another librarian, told another teacher, told another principal, and after a while, they're like, hey man, is it is it okay if we offer you like two hundred bucks for you know to tell stories to our entire middle school? Mm -hmm. Is it okay if you do a training for a staff? Because I think our staff can learn from your stories. Mm -hmm. And I realized something, Christian. During that time, I saw that, you know what, there's a hunger for, for mainstream, mainstream Americans to hear our stories from the first point, first, for, uh, first person. We have to own our stories, mm -hmm. right? We have, to, we, have to be, we have to be powerful enough to say, this is my story, and I'm going to tell it like how I experienced it. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I started experimenting with, yo... How can I put this so that it's educational? So for the teenagers, I bust out to a rap song about being Hmong. Right? Yep. A lot of people know me as a, go Hmong boy, go Hmong yeah, boy, yeah, go. Yeah. Bite that spicy egg, girl Hmong boy, right? Yep. And I didn't even realize that at the time, but that was branding, right? Mm -hmm. There's still people today that say, hey, you're the go Hmong boy guy, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I would do songs like funny, but mm -hmm. educational songs. Um, for teachers, I would do, you know, like um, workshops on how, how to teach kids where their English is not it's not their first language, gotcha. how to work with parents to make them feel more um, welcome at your schools, especially if they're refugee or immigrant parents. So I started having these different messages for different audiences, mm -hmm. and I just kind of took it on the road. Gotcha. Yeah, and so they're like, my senior year, while I was writing my senior thesis um, entitled Why Asian Americans Don't Vote, I would go to schools and, uh, you know, just do a show, and, you know, they'll pay me, like, 200 bucks, 300 yeah. bucks a show, but for me, that was better than nothing, yeah. you know? Yeah. But for me, it wasn't so much about the money. It was about doing what I love mm -hmm. and doing what I think I'm good at. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I love about this country in my experience, thinking back, is that do we live in a country where if you have a passion about something, and if you have any young fans out there, uh, if there's one thing they pick up, I would say, what are you passionate about? What would you want to do and would willing to do it for free mm -hmm. to wake up five in the morning with this adrenaline just pump ready to go out there and do and, and, and do your passion mm -hmm. because don't the money will follow yeah right yeah what are you committed to I mean you've seen examples of that of you know these Hmong gamers who are getting scholarships Sheesh. to be gamers yeah athletes, right? Mm -hmm. Race car driver, yep. um, James Vang, the power lifter, yep. right? Yep. Sunisa Lee, the Hmong Olympian, who's now going to represent us at yep. the 2020 Olympics. So, She's killing yeah, guy. you're hearing all these great stories. Mm -hmm. And um, back then, it was be a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah. Now it's like, no, Do be the marine wear. biologist, yeah. swim with the dolphins, mm -hmm. be the next Steve Jobs, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, be that, that race car driver, like 100%. this little kid racing yeah. motorcycles, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in California, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, be that guy that, like Mark Hur, makes pastries, mm -hmm. be the dude in the apron in the kitchen, and yeah. be famous for it, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think, I, I love that you brought that up, because I think a lot of people don't realize that that's an opportunity for them, that you can do things around your passion. I think now it's a lot even easier because of social media and the capabilities right. and the reach that every single one of us have right right the platforms that we all have back then you didn't even have a platform like, no like social media right right now, not everybody has a chance to speak their their voice or speak their, their truth pretty much right right so people can create like i've seen crazy things where like uh, a dude all he does is like 
um, he draw like cat drawings, but he'll charge for that. Right. And he could just do that for the rest of his right. life. Right. Be much. the best cat draw ever. Right? Exactly. Or like people on YouTube. <laughs> people just be on YouTube yeah. and they be they be unboxing <clears throat> stuff and that's they get the newest stuff. They unbox it and they record it and they get their opinion on it and that's how they make the living. Right. Off right. Of that. So you can really definitely create any uh, yeah, create yeah. a lifestyle, create um um uh. An opportunity for yourself yeah um through these platforms around stuff that you just love doing yeah yeah th- th- pretty around pretty much anything right so, right so i love that you brought that up but yes um just you know i, I agree with that 100 percent. so talk a little bit about i mean i remember you telling this one time during a speech which was after college you ended up staying with your sister yeah in the basement for a year yeah Talk a little bit about that experience and right. kind of what, what you were going through. Then. So I was so privi- um, fortunate that well, during my senior year, there was this grant. And people were like, Yo, you know, I've had friends who were like, yeah, I'm going to law school. I'm going to medical school. I'm going to go out and work for here, here. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So mm-hmm. I applied for this grant, which, yeah. is, um, which is through the Echo and Green Foundation, which okay. is a foundation that um, funds like community service projects, right? Mm-hmm. What idea you have to serve and better the community and we'll give you fifteen thousand dollars, which will mm-hmm. cover your expenses, like cover rent, you know, transportation, living expenses, yeah. and also like you know supplies, so you can continue to give to the community. Mm-hmm. So I got, I got it. I think I was one of like twenty people from around the country, and so basically what that did is that bought me an extra year mm-hmm. to kind of like okay, I I got gas money, I got rent money. Um, I got food. I'm not gonna die. Mm-hmm. So now I can continue to write songs. Mm-hmm. I can continue to write speeches. I continue to go and, and perform at elementary schools. Mm-hmm. And I remember I got this car together, and it had like um, this like this Hmong. Cause I'm like, well, how do I brand myself? Hmong yeah. storyteller, yeah. yeah. Hmong rap artist, mm-hmm. Hmong comedian, and motivational speaker, right? Mm-hmm. Cause these are all the things that I that I am. Um, these are labels that other people gave me. They're yeah. like, oh, you're that monk comedian. Yeah. You're the monk rapper, right? Mm-hmm. So I put it together, and I put like some little website together, phone number, mm-hmm. um, and I just started handing that out. Okay. And so I'm thinking, okay, now where do I have home base? And what year was this? This was 96. Okay. So 96, um, and I think, okay, so I had this money. I need to also do some research yeah. to add to my repertoire. Mm-hmm. I proposed, you know, I'm going to go to Laos. Mm. I'm going to go back to the village where my father was born. Where I was born, the Mekong River, because we talk about, I seen it in story cloths all the time, right? But I want to go back and have pictures. I want to go to the village where my, dra- my dad grew up as a kid and drank out of a stream, mm-hmm. where he hiked the mountains, right? Where he went hunting. Mm-hmm. And long and behold, like when I put the proposal together, they said, that's a great idea. We'll fund it. So I go to my dad, I'm like, Dad, we're going to Laos. My dad's like, son, I don't have money to go to Laos. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, he's working, you know, assembly. He's like, if I go to Laos, I'd rather give this money to them. My cousins are still mm-hmm. living in the jungle, yeah, you know, yeah. that's what's on you I'm like, Dad, I got you. I'm going <laughs> to hire you for a month. You don't work. Mm-hmm. So I pay you a 1000 for a month, mm-hmm. which subsidizes his fee. Yeah. You be my guy, because once I get to Thailand, it's all you. I don't speak Lao. I don't yeah. speak Thai. I don't know where to go. Mm-hmm. So I need your translation, ex- your cultural expertise. Mm-hmm. You go with me, I'll cover all the expenses. Yeah. And my dad's like, my son's, I mean, he kind of <laughs> saw my negotiation yeah. skills. He's like, all right, all right, that could work. Yeah. And so I got him to agree to go to Laos with me. So we went there for a month, mm-hmm. and we went, we, we met his brothers who still live in the jungle, uh, in the village. The, where we went, we had to hike three hours from the nearest road. We had to get, take a plane, take a helicopter, take a bus all day long, and then hike three hours. It was like, Jeez. like this is the remote jungle, mm-hmm. right? My cousins still sleep on the dirt floor. Mm-hmm. They showed me where grandpa and grandma was buried. They showed me where my dad went hunting as a young kid and shot, killed a mountain lion and saved grandpa's life. Mm. They took me to these places where my dad was like, son, when I was young, I had a girlfriend in that village, <laughs> and I had a girlfriend in that village. And I was like, what? Yep. And so, dude, for that was, I think if there was one um, a turning point in my life, that was also a turning point, a moment in my life where when you go back to the motherland, right, and um, you breathe the air and you, like in the morning, they burn certain things, right? You breathe the air, you, the, the green lush mountains, and you fly over the Mekong River and you see the dark, dirty, muddy waters. You think about all the people who've died crossing that river mm. and you hear so you know there's this like you get the goosebumps 
like the like the moment they're like, yeah, there's a spirit that just comes over you, right? Yeah. And and I'm glad I went at the time when I was mature enough to take it all in. And I would go and they would say, Ti, me too. They would say, Call off the Ula and they would pull me to sit and my uncle said gave me a chair to sit on, but they sat on the on the stool on the ground. And I said, No, because I'm Mika. And they wanted to honor me and I said, I don't want the chair. Mm -hmm. I want to come and learn, get back to my roots. I'm going to sleep on the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit on the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm going to eat what you eat. And they looked at me like, this dude's a little different, right? <laughs> but for me, yeah. it was more about just the journey. Mm -hmm. It was the spiritual journey. It was my own personal way to how I want to experience um, what my parents lived. Yep. And so when I went back with this mentality, like, I'm not high and mighty from, from America. I want to get back to my roots. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I... Yeah, I, my clothes, they're like, I would just wear like, you know, right, I did dress up uh, in suit and tie like some of these yeah. Dr. Tom dudes. Yeah. <laughs> and they looked at me, my jeans are kind of dirty. They're like, you? they looked at me like, dude, you're from America, but you're yeah. not, you're not like dressed sharp like mm -hmm. those guys. You're kind of dirty like us. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, the, my point of coming here is not to showcase what I, yeah. you know, my point is to, to immerse myself in your experience. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, bro, coming back, I, I was never the same person again. Mm -hmm. sure. I looked at myself. It was a full circle moment for me. Yeah. I encourage every person who grew up here or came in at a young age to go back. Go back. Um, now, when you go, don't have a lot of expectations. Mm -hmm. When you go, be humble. And when you go, just um, kind of do what they do and allow, allow the journey to take you with the journey. Don't plan like, oh, this is what I got to do. Yeah. I got to go do this and this. No. Just go and I kind of like really go with the flow and mm -hmm. let let the journey um, unfold itself mm -hmm. to you, you know. And that for me was powerful. I um I saw my uncles. We had they had a cow. The, the love in that village, um, this village I stay. All my brothers they came up to me. They started my little niece and nephew started touching my arm. I was like, what can I do? They look a mon kai because mm -hmm. they're darker, yeah, yeah. they're skinnier. They yeah. thought me as chubby. They took me to um. They're like, they know a couple come. People talk about Tango Hoche. I'm like, yeah, I always want to do that. Yeah. They took me to talk to girls, you know, <laughs> at night. They took me to Papa during the yeah. New Year. Um, I went and visited some very humble monk sisters yeah. and ate in their home. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I tell you, bro, I saw monk love. I saw monk brotherhood in its purest form. Mm. When someone has, they have nothing, mm -hmm. and they say, "Come eat with us." Mm -hmm. And they pull out their two, three dishes. And they say, please eat. And you're like, wow. And they give you the, the best piece of the chicken because you're from America. Yeah. And you're like, dude, I eat this all the time. Yeah. And you can tell that they waited months to eat that piece of meat. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so That's I saw sweet. love and I saw gratitude. I saw my uncle. They have two cows. My uncle said, we're going to sacrifice this cow in your honor. Wow. Because you guys, it's been 30 some years. Mm -hmm. And my dad cried. I cried. I'm like, no, we gave the money to buy a new cow. Mm -hmm. I saw love in its truest form. You know, you see a little bit of that when you take monk people out. They're like, oh, I got it. Yeah, I got yeah. it. No, no. You know, we kind of fight Back for the bill. Yep. But I saw the root of that, mm -hmm. right? Jeez. And I saw that the, I think my dad calls the true worth of um, being a mona, the more the blue one, richness. Yep. Our richness and our wealth is not in the dollars in our pockets. Mm -hmm. It's not in our cars, our, our bank statement, how big our homes is. Our true wealth as Hmong people is in how we greet each other. Mm -hmm. Brotherhood. is one of the most powerful brother words. Right? Mm -hmm. I saw love. In, in, and man, it's just, when I think about this, I, I, I think all the stories that we grew up listening to from our parents, mm -hmm. And all the lectures, you know, good for good and bad, it all kind of came together. Sense. And I understood that, yeah. man, all the time my dad, like, didn't you want? Yeah. You know, like, I, I saw how it came from a place of love. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, it was powerful, awesome. bro. Yeah. I'm sure they're, like, pretty much, I mean, I guess, to put that all together, it kind of just changed your mindset, changed your outlook on the world. Yeah. Pretty much kind of like a little bit of a culture shock a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was culture shock again. Yeah. Because I went there, um, they drank out of a stream, mm -hmm. right? 
And then, you know, for five days, I, and I said to my cousin, um, yeah. I gotta go to the bathroom. And he's like, mm. He's like, yeah. you just go to the woods. I'm like, what? And I went. <laughs> yeah. It was uncomfortable, but yeah. I did it. That's what they did. You right? know? Like you said. They went, they took the water out of the stream, they heated it up to use it for cooking and, mm-hmm. and for, for heating, you know? And they were cooking, and I was, I got I got down and dirty with them. Gotcha. Um, and so I think as, you know, here I was, went to a liberal arts, like I told you earlier, I was sat next to like the sons and daughters of like CEOs, you know, mm-hmm. who were king, who were like forty, fifty thousand dollars scholarship, uh, uh, you know, to college tuition, they wrote That's a nothing. check for, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so here I'm sitting with my cousins mm-hmm. who have to share a bowl of rice, mm-hmm. and I'm like, wow. So it was culture shock, but it was also, um, it was also uh, again a full circle because you, not only did I see the world differently, I saw myself differently mm-hmm. in my place in the mm-hmm. world. Gotcha. Yeah, so I'll say, I'm it, for young people who go there, you're never going to be the same person mm-hmm. again. You yeah. look through the world with a different set of lenses. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I definitely got to go visit myself. We had a study abroad trip in college that I never went on, but yeah. they would go and they would visit. Right. Um, and all of them came back like they, they right. culture shock. They just yeah. different. They have a different outlook on the world now. You know? Yeah, yeah. So it's that all makes sense. So now you, after that trip, you came back. Yeah. What were you up to then? I mean, so I came back and I was like a fireball. I'm like, yo, I gotta, I gotta share this. Like, yeah. what did I see? Yeah. I show pictures. I show, um, I documented uh, my trips. Like, yo, these are my cousins. Yeah. And I was able to put that back then. We didn't have social media, right? So mm-hmm. I'm like putting it through slides, mm-hmm. right? Um, and uh, I, you know, I remember having the clicker. You had to get like this, those mm-hmm. little slide things where you go click one, uh, the negative slides. Yep. So I remember dragging this huge thing along, like click, 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 click. <laughs> this is my uncle. This is my grandma. Yeah. This is the house where my dad was born. This is the village mm-hmm. where he lived. Um, yeah, so it was empowering people through stories. Mm-hmm. And so after my show, I'd make people laugh. Um, but then afterwards, I'd, I'd, I'd bust out the slides. Mm-hmm. And they saw that, you know, there's the term comedy. In, in, in tragedy, there's, there's, there's com- in comedy, there's tragedy, right? So while I'm entertaining people, they think, oh, f- monk rapper, monk comedian, behind the story is the tragedy. Mm. It's the heartbreak. Yep. It's, this is, when I showed stories, I go, this is, my dad took me to the place where we crossed the Mekong River. So after they laughed about all, you know, coming to America and, you know, being made fun of and all the goofy stuff we did, there's this one picture I said, you know, my dad took me to the same spot. I said, Dad, I want to go to the spot where we made our escape across the river. Well, our neighbors didn't make it. And we did. Yep. And we got there. My dad's like, and it's it's it. There's some houses there now. We went through these back alley, and my dad's like, it's right about here. And my dad got into his mode. He got into his storytelling mode. Normally he likes to talk a lot, but then I I sensed that he just went like dead silent. Mm. And he, I think it was his way of saying, "Son, let me just take a moment to myself." Mm-hmm. Because the night we made our escape, it was one o'clock in the morning. We had two families. My dad pretty much had packed everything, you know, like converted our entire life savings into, into silver bars. Yeah. So waiting by the banks of the river, and these these Thai fishermen came. They met our family, and uh, they're like, "Okay, well, we said adults are different from kids, but now everyone's being charged the same thing for every." I had a sister who was only eight days old, so we're getting ready to go. We were supposed to be the second ship, but because the other family didn't have their family money together, we went first. Mm-hmm. My mom said it was raining, monsoon season. Mm. We couldn't even, they didn't allow us to bring luggage. So we're going across. And while we're going across, my dad and the uncle, uncle, uncle these are some stories I picked a uh, piece together later on, yep. saw that there was something fishy about these fishermen. So we made it across. They came to the Thailand side after about a 40 fin- 45 minute ride or an hour ride in total darkness, right? Moment they thought, please, dogs, not right? Like we were just praying, please, the ancestors watch over us. Yep, yep. And then they come back and they pick up our neighbors. And then halfway across, my mother said, when we were on the other side, she heard loud noises. She heard babies choking water. We found out the next day the same fishermen that took us across turned their weapons on their neighbor family. Riled them of everything. Threw everyone into the water. The babies she heard were choking with babies drowning. Gosh. And of the 23 people, five survivors. 
one, one dad, there was one person who could swim, the adult male, picked up, he would swim, picked up a child out of the water by the hair, because baby's, baby's floating. Yep. He looked, if, it one of the, if it wasn't his child, my mom said he would just drop the kid in the back of water because he wanted to save at least one or two of his. He saved two of his kids. The other two adults found something to cling on and paddled their way to, to safety. That's crazy. So the next day, we find out what mm -hmm. happened. So all this happened. So when we went back to Laos, my dad lived through all this. Yep. So my dad needed a moment to take it all in. And I just gave him that time because I heard this story. I was like, Dad, you just take all the time yep. to me. And among fathers rarely cry. Mm, yeah. And, but even though tears didn't come out of my dad's eyes, I felt them. Yeah. He was like, and he and he and he, there's a picture that I show of my dad pointing, saying, "This is this son is where we escape mm. from here to there." And I have that picture of my dad by the Mekong Delta. Wow. Right. Yeah. And that's just one picture. There's so many moments yeah. that I caught in time. That was, um, it was like reliving. It was like a history book in pictures mm -hmm. and reliving us, re, uh, some of these stories. Gotcha. And for my for our parents, it's very traumatic, mm -hmm. right? Because these are life changing stories. Yeah. These are life or death stories. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'm so fortunate that I still have all that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an amazing experience um, to be able to do that and go back with your dad and for him to be able to take you back and just kind of backtrack yeah. on everything he's been through or that yeah. you guys have been through. So. So when we came back, I took, I, you know, I took some of these stories, I, I elaborated more, mm -hmm. and I used these stories as a tool to educate. You know, when you hear about Hmong people, we're not just refugees from the mountain, mm -hmm. you know, and all. No, there's a much, there's a much deeper. For sure. And that story has to do with, like, PTSD. Mm -hmm. Now you, for hot doctors, now you better understand, now you can better understand anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and PTSD in our elderly community, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, for teachers, you can understand sort of the how what we think in Hmong and we think in English, the translation, how we have dual mindset. Mm -hmm. When you give us a lesson, it, it might take us three extra hours to read a lesson plan. Mm -hmm. um, so when I educate, there's a different story there for teachers, for cops who are, inter, you know, who are interacting with our community to build trust, Yeah. Um, for healthcare providers across mm -hmm. the board. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so you're doing your thing um, when you're back. You're doing all these shows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Talk and... I mean, you've gone to like a lot of different schools. I, I think that's how a lot of people my age kind of know you, or even mm -hmm. a little bit more older than yeah. like my uncles and stuff. They kind of know you because yeah. you kind of went through schools, a lot of shows that you were yeah. kind of talking about. Um, and even you came to my college one time. Yeah. I remember meeting you there. Um, and you killed it, of course. Um, but talk about a little bit about now, because I know I know you got to dip out of here soon. Oh yeah. Ta talk, a little, talk a little bit about what you're doing, up, what you're up to now. I know you're kind of involved in the community and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and you talked a little bit about you always wanted to do that. Right. Talk a little bit about like the stuff you've been in, stuff that has stuck out to you, why it's so important to you. Right. Um, just. Yeah. So, yeah. So this thing just kind of, um, naturally evolved to become, you know, so I've always worked for myself. Yeah. Cause I've had people like, dude, you should apply for this job. I'm thinking, you know, if I do three or four gigs a week, same that, thing. that's the same thing. You yeah. know, I'm making more than I'm doing nine to five. Yeah. Um, so I incorporated and I worked for myself. I, there was a time when I hired an assistant to do all my bookings. Mm. And it's crazy. I think at the height of my busiest times, I would do like five states in a week. Mm. It's weird. I remember looking back wow. and I was in yeah. Seattle, Boston, Kansas City, Cali. And I think, wow, that's like five days, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I made good money. Yeah. But I was taking, I was sleeping on the plane. I'm writing up and catching up my speeches and stuff. Like I was checking in and out of hotels. Um, so yeah, I love the travel because each... Each uh, show was like a new experience mm -hmm. because if I'm presenting to a group of like white kids from a small town, right, it's different from speaking to a bunch of Southeast Asian kids mm -hmm. among kids in Fresno, right, or uh, college students. Mm -hmm. um, so my audience kept changing. Yeah. And so through these different audiences, I learned like what stories resonate with certain audiences. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so overall, like over 1,600 programs in 45 states. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so now I've kind of toned down once, you know, when I got married, um, I, I decided to maybe work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'd still love to travel, but I wanted to, I didn't want to travel as much. Mm -hmm. And so I still did, you know, um, I cut my shows in half mm -hmm. and I was able to make as just as much money. Mm -hmm. Um, so Charge that, a little bit more or what? Yeah. yeah so that, that, um, that helped. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but now I'm to the point where, you know, I, as a performer, I'm out there and I'm, I'm performing <clears throat> But also as a 
sort of humanitarian, right, as an activist mentality, um, I also saw a lot of injustices mm. because I pay attention to politics. So, for example, when Chai Shua Vang came out, right, in 204, this Hmong hunter um, killed six white hunters, right? They didn't say a Minnesota hunter killed six Wisconsin hunters. Mm -hmm. The news media said a Hmong immigrant killed six white hunters. Yeah, yeah. So because of that, it plastered. I mean, think about it. It was uh, it, it, That was even, you know, like it, 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 to this day with all the anti-immigrant sentiments, right? Yeah. And this was like, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. So can you imagine, like, everyone's like, whoa, what are these immigrants doing coming to kill our people? Yeah. But that wasn't the story. Mm -hmm. That was what the media portrayed yeah. of the story. And it turned out that he was a citizen. Mm -hmm. He was a business owner. He was a clan leader. He was a shaman. Mm -hmm. He volunteered with youth. You know, he was a father. He worked three jobs. Mm -hmm. He had kids named Arnold and Mike who played football, right? Mm -hmm. And he volunteered to um, like teach uh, uh, martial arts to kids at a youth center. Mm -hmm. But that story wasn't told. Yep. All the national media saw, saw was this Hmong hunter shot and killed. But wait, why did he? What happened? What mm -hmm. story? Mm -hmm. Oh, he just went mad yeah. and crazy, like as in the sharpshooter, you know. And yeah. like he, so the story wasn't the media portray of his story and that incident was, I believe, unfair. Yeah, right? for sure. So I said, someone needs to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So I was part of this group. We went to the trial. Um, we, uh, we, we observed the trial. We, we were able to tell a different story from the monk community. For example, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like, when you went to that trial, everyone was like, yeah, you know, it was a slam dunk. Just lock him away because he killed six white yeah. people. No one wanted to ask why. No one was searching for the truth. When we came back and we asked a room full of 500 monk people and said, how many of you guys felt he had a fair trial? None of the hands went up. I said, how many of you felt he had an unfair trial? Every single hand mm -hmm. went up. So it goes to, sh it, it was a clear picture to me of how the justice system works. It works for some people and not for others. Mm -hmm. And that incident was, a, um, it provoked, it, it, it caught my curiosity that this wasn't the first time and it, was, it wasn't the last, right? And so since then, there's been a lot of other high profile cases mm -hmm where race is a, is a factor. Two years after that, there was another Chai Bank, a Chai Bank shooting where yeah. their roles were reversed. That. A yeah. white hunter killed a Hmong hunter, mm -hmm. and he actually said in the trial in the court, I'm gonna go and kill, shoot me a Hmong one of these days. Mm -hmm. You know, the Hmong me put people are bad and mean. Yeah. He was documented saying that, so was it premeditated hate crime, right? Mm -hmm. And then later on, fast forward a few years, you had the Fong Lee incident in yeah. Minneapolis yeah. where this Hmong kid was shot in the back by um you know a uh, 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 Minneapolis police officer yep. and then there's a Jason Yang like he some Hmong guy mysteriously became a ninja and jumped off some 40 yep. foot parking ramp and died right yep. like how did he how did he think he was going to make that jump yeah. right yep. so there's there's these stories that don't make sense to us mm -hmm. like we see the bullshit mm -hmm. and so we got to call out the bullshit of course and so what I try to do is listen you know what I'm not just going to take things as mm -hmm. they're given to me I we were brought because of our education. We were, if there's anything our parents did for us, they brought us to a country where we can learn to think critically, mm -hmm. all right? To just ask the questions, the brave questions that aren't being asked. Mm -hmm. Why did he shoot these people? Mm -hmm. Why did Jason Yang, how did Jason Yang jump 40 feet to his mm -hmm. death? Fong Lee, what was he doing at the time he got shot in the back? Mm -hmm. Like, what did the cameras say? Yep. Versus the testimony, yep. you know? Cha Vang, what happened? Why did he? Why was he killed and buried in the woods mm -hmm. and shot and stabbed and beaten? And why, like for example, this coming month, last year in um, Michigan, in Lansing, Michigan, a Hmong hunter was shot on, during a hunting trip. And to this day, they're still calling the the, uh, the the sheriff's department is still calling it a territorial accident. How can it be an accident when he was shot? His gun is possession. Gun was stolen. His backpack was stolen. And he got shot in the head. Mm. So the labels are very um, misleading. Mm -hmm. And so as Hmong Americans, as people of color, we've seen this in other communities of color too, like with Black Lives Matter, yeah, right? Yeah. There's always two narratives, that one that one that is politically correct and, you know, and then one that says, wait a minute, there's got to be more. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Something's too fishy here. Yeah. So for the last 20 years, um, while I've been performing, I've also, have taken the time to volunteer to advocate for a lot of these families mm -hmm. who have not felt that the justice um, 
the legal system didn't serve just mm -hmm. didn't do them justice. Gotcha. Helping to go to court with them to help mm -hmm. them write their um, uh, press statements to help them find legal advice mm -hmm. um, to help them find legal representation. Yeah. Um, you know the three the triple murder in Wisconsin recently, and yeah, so it's tough. and and that kind of keeps me grounded. It reminds me there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. To improve race relations. I love that you're always at the forefront of those things because I mean, I feel like. Like, I don't know who else would be. I mean, I love that you're always at the forefront of those things and you're always helping direct the conversations and mm. you've been there before and you've mm. always just been able to, just been able to, I mean, ask the right questions and right. be able to make sure the family knows kind of what's going on. Or even just yeah. people, like you go Facebook Live and you'll be, you'll like update everybody on yeah. like what's happening. Yeah. Um, I love that you're, you're, you do that. Um, and I appreciate everything you guys are doing out there for the community. What's kind of next for you? I mean, yeah. Um, is it more more of the community activism, more, more yeah. shows, or what do you kind of want to work on next? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've been doing the community side for a long time. I've got a few ideas in the works, you know. Mm. Um, I don't know, a lot of people are telling me, too, you should run for office, right? Yeah. I get that a lot. Yeah. I'm like, well, we'll, we'll see, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I know that to be in the public eye, I'm already a public figure in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, um, some folks will say, too, you should go to law school. You're already doing lawyer's work. You might as well get paid for yeah, it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause like a lawyer. Th these yeah. families would call the long lawyers, and long lawyers are like, nah, call Tudor because he works for free, right? Yeah. Um, I get a lot of like, uh, oh, do you live in Wisconsin? You know, because mm -hmm. you're always in Wisconsin fighting these social justice causes. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, to be honest with you, you know, I, uh, I just went through a, a tough breakup. And so uh, I'll be vulnerable out there. You know, I was married for seven years, mm -hmm. and um, I, le I learned a lot. Um, still love her and, and wish her well, and we just have different different uh, um, career paths, yeah. you know, different goals of what we envision a life to be. And yeah. so I think for me, for me now, I feel like I have this empty platter in front of me. Mm -hmm. I recently got um, a fellowship to the Bush Fellowship, and so... I saw that, yeah. That, um, and that grant is to further my... Um, myself as a leader or as a, you know, um, in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. I've got a trip going to Laos, Thailand, Vietnam to do a three country tour on a wow. leadership cultural tour coming yeah. up next year. Um, I, I, I do plan to write a book someday. Really? Yeah, I yeah. think you should, man. Um, I think you should. So, yeah, so I got a lot of things yeah. in the works. And yeah. for me, I can't sit still. Like, um, yeah. You know, I have to be able to. Seems like it. Yeah, yeah I got to uh, be able to keep doing something. And yeah. for me, it's about. It, it's not doing just for the sake of doing, but it's doing to stay um, connected and to learn, mm -hmm. right? Because I always feel like you know, I'm learning from so many people. Right now, dude, I'm, I'm inspired by you. And like the Ming Nows, <laughs> right? And yeah. the James Vang and mm -hmm. like, um, you know, all these young people who are like, you know, like the Sunni Salis. And, yep. you know, I host Monk Day at the fair. Yep. And I try to bring all the up young, young the, the up and coming talent, like Panya, yep. right? Yep. And Mabu, because... I'm a fan. Yep. I realized, wow, because when I first started out, I had a few OGs that said to me, Tutana, they didn't understand rap, but they're like, <laughs> and, and they got my back, even though they didn't know what rap was. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, they didn't understand a word I was saying, but they knew their kids loved it. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm at the point where I think I want to kind of be like an ambassador, like mm -hmm. an advisor to a lot of the younger talents mm -hmm. and help foster them. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and I, I want to, I got some uh, private business ventures where, you know, I want to be able to make money too because I don't want to be working forever, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to have to go and say, hey, can we have 5000 to do this project? I want to be able to write that check and yeah. say, here's 5000 you go do that, yep. you know. Yep. So, yeah, so I'm excited for this yeah. next chapter in my life. Awesome, yeah. That yeah. sounds amazing, man. Yeah. Um, so we come to the end of this podcast. Yeah. What would you say to someone that wants to kind of be like you or kind of be in the same professions or I guess just some words of like motivation, inspiration? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I tell people, I use this quote, I mean, it's overused, but it, 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 I'll, I'll share it again. As um, be the one that you've been waiting for. Because too often we wait for that. Traditionally, our parents mm -hmm. are like, mm -hmm. when are we going to have a leader? When are we going to have the next Nippon, right? Mm -hmm. When are we going to have right? mm -hmm. our own land? I'm like, no, no, no. Be the ones you've been waiting I for. I love that. Be your own hero. Mm -hmm. 
be your own voice. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, you know, when these incidents happen all over the country, uh, Wisconsin, like, you know, call Thunza. Like, next time I want to get to the point where, no, don't call me. Yeah. Go to the courthouse. Yeah. Get your sons and daughters with their college degrees. Can go write this. Mm -hmm. I'll mentor you, but you be the face of your own cause, your mm -hmm. own movement. Yeah. You know? We need because I can't do this forever. Mm -hmm. You know? And so uh, just do your research. Mm -hmm. And I use the mentality, Christian. People are like, Thunza, why do you go help? Right? I say, you know what? When it, ha when, when it comes to, like, um, catastrophe and in crisis in our community, I think of the burning house mentality. Because traditionally, big mama, you wait until someone comes and buys you a case of beer and come to your house to do a formal ass and cook a meal and all that, mm -hmm. bake all, like kowtow to you, no, no. Don't wait for that. Mm -hmm. See a burning building and know that's your monk cousins, even though it's not a different clan name, bring a bucket of water and run as fast as you can and help out. Yeah. If you have that mentality, and imagine that mentality, 10 people have it, 100 people have it, imagine the kind of like um, collective collaboration and how we can elevate our entire community. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for like the old school to have buy a case for the clan leaders to buy you a case, mm -hmm. you know, at these clan meetings and present to you and all that. No. Um, so, so be passionate and act on that passion, right? So that's all I have to say for the young people is that, you know, and don't wait. Because, you know, when I went to Wisconsin, we did this Dylan Yang thing. And people were like, well, which organization are we going to have get the permit? I'm like, just put it under my name. Yeah. Who are you? I'm Tunja Sean Consulting. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, we need, um, what else do I need? We need a permit. We need, um, you know, we need someone to um, set up the sound system. Okay, we got volunteers. Food. We got Hmong mothers who will cook. Mm -hmm. It was so organic and so, like, um, where everyone just came together. And the traditional thinking mentality was, which organization and which leaders and who are your members? And we didn't have a member. It was all through social media. Mm -hmm. It was all through, listen, there's a cause, create the movement, and allow others to be part of a movement which mm -hmm. is greater than themselves. Yeah. You don't need titles. Mm -hmm. You don't need offices and meetings mm -hmm. and cases of beer. And, you know, you don't. <laughs> you don't. Just just yeah. create the movement and other people will come. Yep. And don't do it for the title. Yep. Don't do it for the recognition. Mm -hmm. Do it because your heart is there. Do it because racism pisses you off. Yep. Do it because discrimination hurts all communities. Mm -hmm. Do it because Dylan Yang could have been your nephew, mm -hmm. could have been your son. Do it because Chai Shua could have been you. Mm -hmm. Right? Do it because this old Hmong guy, Tong 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 Mo Yang, could have been my dad. Mm -hmm. Do it because Pia Maivu could have been your sister and your brother-in-law, right? So don't wait until your house is burned. You know, go help others first, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, that's, that's if there's one thing I want your, <laughs> your, mem your listeners to hear, yep. take that. For sure. Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Hey, thanks a lot, man. I yep. appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy, but, yeah, I appreciate it, man. Okay, looking forward yeah. to hearing it. So. Awesome. Great. All right.